today. Welcome to the webinar, the combustion webinar. Today we have Sam Manzello, who's obtained his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois, Chicago. He now works with uh, NIST doing uh, fire research in a variety of fields and uh, is going to tell us about some of the work that he's been doing on Wildland urban interface fires that have been known to cause quite some destruction and are a growing problem around the world. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and also thanks again uh, to Professor Ju uh, for uh, the opportunity to talk as well as the, uh, uh, the adjustment of the time. Um, I'd like to first off acknowledge uh, a lot of the work I'll be talking about today has been mainly in collaboration with the Dr. Suzuki, who works at the National Research Institute of Fire and Disaster, which is in Chofu in Tokyo. And also, um, we've been doing a lot of work with the Building Research Institute, which is also in Japan, but it's in Tsukuba, so uh, just outside of Tokyo. And um, uh, those of you that can read Japanese, it simply just says arigatou gozaimasu which means uh, thank you very much. Uh, this work would not be possible without, without all the excellent support and uh, help from Japan. Also, um, there's some, there was some sad news uh, this year. Um, a good friend of mine, actually, I worked with at NIST uh, for many years, uh, uh, Mr. Randy Shields. Um, he passed away this year. And uh, it's, um, he was a really close friend. And there's a picture of Randy. Randy actually helped me a lot in the early days. So this is us doing some experiments many years ago. And uh, um, Randy had never left uh, the U.S. And, uh, and actually the first time in his life visited uh, a foreign country was coming to Japan. And so, uh, you know, we had many fond memories and uh, he really enjoyed the warmth of the Japanese people. And uh, every day I do experiments here, I, I always think about Randy and it was very sad to hear that he had passed away this year. So um, I, I really wanted to mention his uh, help and I really appreciate his memory. Um, also, um, I'd like to thank many people um, related to uh, combustion and fire science. Um, as you saw in this webinar, um, I think this is the first webinar in this series that is actually related to fire research. And um, uh, all the others are more, uh, much more traditional combustion. And I've been helped by many different people. Um, uh, many of these people you see here uh, are mainly much more combustion science oriented people. Carlos is one person who was mainly a combustion person who moved into fire. And uh, so many of them have helped uh, me in various aspects uh, uh, along the way. So I just wanted to thank these people um, to uh, giving a voice to fire science and the combustion community. Um, a little bit of background about me. Um, I think a lot of it was in the flyer. Uh, basically, I did my PhD at the University of Illinois Chicago um, and all of my degrees are mechanical engineering. And back when I was a student, um, I had a fellowship from NASA, uh, which let me actually do uh, microgravity research as my PhD. So even back in the PhD days, I came to Japan many times. We worked in the JAMIC facility, which I know Professor Maruto is quite familiar with that facility. It's now closed, but it was a really awesome drop tower, 10 seconds of facility that we used. And at that time, uh, we were collaborating with Professor Hirano, who has actually passed away. Um, and also with Professor Dreyer at Princeton. And um, in the US, there's a nice program, uh, the National Research Council. Uh, you can join uh, institutes via a fellowship program. So I, I received this fellowship and I joined NIST. And uh, um, I've been involved in many different projects at NIST um, and actually uh, been in Japan the past seven years. And I'm now uh, a member of the Combustion Institute, but I'm actually a member of the Combustion uh, Society of Japan itself. So I'm currently not the, a U.S. member. I'm the Japanese member uh, for everybody, if they're interested. Um, so uh, I'll now go into some detail about the uh, uh, NIST. I think everybody on this call knows what's NIST. And I wasn't sure of the audience because I know you have a global presence. So uh, NIST is part of the United States Department of Commerce. And it was founded in 1901. And many of you might be familiar, especially people that are more senior researchers, it used to be called MBS, the National Bureau of Standards. Um, and the name was changed to NIST. And uh, um, NIST has one distinction that we have four Nobel Prize winning staff in physics. Uh, this is the highest of any US government laboratory. And also uh, one of our uh, staff um, received the Kyoto Prize, which is a very prestigious award. And also there's two National Medal of Science winners. And also you might be familiar with many famous uh, other staff, for example, Hugh Dryden, um, or many of you use the Buckingham Pie Theorem. Uh, 
Um, and then these are some of our Nobel winners here. So NIST has a long uh, distinguished uh, history in many different uh, areas of science and technology. So since I mentioned this webinar is about fire, well, why should combustion science care about fire research? And uh, the way I think about this is that fire really impacts many aspects of society. So for example, today we'll be talking mainly about large earth fires, but for example, there's many other important issues, for example, fire safety in high rise buildings. Um, for example, that's a very uh, a historical uh, picture there, but there was a more recent incidents in, in many high rise buildings, for example. And also uh, in Japan, there's been outdoor fires. Uh, that's the uh, uh, Kobe earthquake picture there, for example. So really in fire research, uh, we can improve people's life. And you know, clearly combustion science has an important role to play in all these aspects, even though these are very, what would appear very practical aspects, I would say, of more combustion related science. So the webinar today is gonna be focused essentially on four different areas, um, sort of what are large outdoor fires in the built environment? What are some important physical processes that we need research on? And one message I wanna present here is we really need help from the combustion community in this problem. And also I'll, I'll close with the need for globally accepted standard test methods to begin to address this uh, particular issue. So now we're talking about large outdoor fires in the built environment. Um, I think this is an important picture to show um, from the point of view that um, we're not dealing with a new problem here. So this is a very interesting image. This is actually from the Meriki fire in 1657. And this is interesting because as an American, for example, this is before uh, the United States was a country. So you can see that Japan was dealing with these kind of urban fires uh, for a long, long time, as well as other countries as well. And what I like to show in the background, you can see in the images, you can see all those particles that are burning. And these are uh, in Japanese known as hinoko, or, or in English, it's firebrands. And firebrands is still a very big global problem to this day. So that's one of the focuses of this uh, uh, webinar. And you can see that uh, in Japan, as an example, going back three to 400 years during the Edo era, uh, they were devising firefighting techniques to deal with firebrand showers. So this is a photo that Dr. Suzuki provided to me. And I also think it's quite fascinating um, uh, to look at uh, these you know, very historical firefighting techniques for a, you know, a long known problem in Japan and also many other countries. So if we go to modern times, um, uh, one thing that's important is that uh, wild and fires that spread in the communities, which are known as wild and urban interface fires, have really become a global problem. Um, and you know, you've seen these a lot, especially in the United States. Uh, for example, also in Australia is a big issue with this, and also Europe has a big issue as well. Um, and in many uh, large urban areas, there's still the risk of urban fires, basically. And a more uh, recent addition to this problem is related to informal settlement fires. So um, uh, these are informal sentiment communities. For example, here you see one in uh, uh, South Africa. And uh, uh, all of these fires have important uh, characteristics and commonalities that I'll be discussing in this particular uh, webinar. So one thing that uh, it's important to understand is that uh, a, a few years ago as part of ASTM International, um, we held a workshop and the idea behind that was to say, well, where are we in terms of the uh, standards and codes for these type of fires in the United States? And uh, one thing that we learned from this uh, international workshop really is that uh, if we wanna look at wild and urban interface fires, there's really a better, a, a clear need for a much more comprehensive understanding of the fire physics of what's going on here. So um, there's an editorial and everything that's been published related to this, if you're interested in seeing it as well as the presentation. but. It was identified this is sort of a, 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 an issue that needs a lot of attention and, and research. And uh, another thing that we developed um, as for fire research community is the fire research community has a, uh, a, a forum of fire research directors. And it's a group of all the institutes and, and various organizations that work on fire research throughout the world. And because of the importance of this WUI problem, um, there was a need to develop a position paper to basically identify some key needs of research and, and missing knowledge gaps. So um, I was honored to ask to lead this effort. And uh, basically it's a very short paper, but it discusses some important needs and missing gaps that we really need to work on in order to get this type of uh, 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 problem uh, better uh, dealt with in the future. And you can see, unfortunately, since those times, 
Uh, the problem is just becoming worse globally. So these are just a whole bunch of pictures. For example, in the top, you see Alberta, Canada. I think many of you probably saw this on YouTube of all the people evacuating in the middle of the fire brand storm. Um, you look at, for example, Korea and Asia had a very huge problem uh, of leaf fire problem. And Japan in 2016 had in Nitogawa City near Niigata had a, a large urban uh, fire problem. Australia has had many, many problems as I think everybody knows. And uh, also if you go down to South America, uh, Chile, has had issues and uh, South Africa and the Philippines have had many issues with informal settlement fires, as well as uh, Portugal has, has also had many devastating wood fires. So it's a global problem and it's not getting any better. And there's a lot of missing things that need to be addressed related to this. Um, here are some more pictures. This is California, 2018. Um, and once again, that's a picture of South Korea. Um, I don't remember the exact statistics, but I mean, the fire in Korea was very, very bad. So the, a large percentage of the military was deployed to try to put out this particular uh, war fire that was observed uh, there in Korea. So if you look at wilder interface fires as one form of outdoor fire, um, you have to be able to map sort of the hazards of what's going on with that. And you can see that even though these fires are occurring in many places throughout the world, there hasn't been many actual mapping of the, the specific uh, areas. So for example, you see that in the United States, uh, there's been a handful of studies in South America, there's been a few. Um, but in, even in light of all these massive fires that are occurring, um, uh, there hasn't been so many uh, actual mapping of these different uh, situations. And turning to the United States, um, for example, in, uh, if you're familiar with CAL FIRE, CAL FIRE is the agency in the United States that deals with a lot of these large uh, outdoor fires. And um, for example, the CAMP FIRE, which people are probably familiar with, uh, this fire, for example, in November 2018, uh, destroyed uh, almost 20,000 structures. Um, this was a massive fire. And you can see that uh, the list goes on and on in terms of fires and the destruction. And it's really a big, uh, a big uh, uh, issue, specifically in California as well as other places in the United States. And also the other issue, as I mentioned, is when you talk about the wild interface, there's various definitions used throughout the globe. And so here's a uh, table showing, for example, some definitions that are used in the United States versus Canada versus Australia and other countries. And um, as I'll be discussing later, there's also going to be, there's clearly a need for uniform global uh, definitions uh, related to these issues. So another thing that might surprise many of you as well is that even though it's such a global problem, um, there was no basically comprehensive source of accepted knowledge on this topic. So what we, did at the invitation of Springer Nature basically is develop an encyclopedia of wildfires and wildland urban interface fires. And uh, I can tell you quite frankly, this was a huge undertaking since there was nothing that existed before. So I worked on this as editor in chief with a great team of people that I asked to help me for basically three years. And uh, um, it was a huge amount of work. Um, you know, you're starting from essentially scratch and uh, we, in the end, we had uh, more than 200 authors from all over the world working on this. And this is all done in everybody's time. I mean, of course, we didn't pay anybody for this. And uh, um, there's 171 contributions published from these authors from all over the world. And those of you that are new to the topic, this is a great resource to now go to and understand what, what, what we're talking about here. And a really important resource, I think, to get information uh, related to it. And because it was unique in the sense that it hadn't been done, the minute it's published, it's received a lot of attention. I mean, on social media, as well as downloads and also a lot of citations since the book is published. So I encourage, um, it's on Springer Nature's website to take a look at this. And just if you want to learn more about uh, the different terminologies and things in wild and urban interface and wildfires in general. So, of course, with the, the uh, colleagues on the webinar, you're interested, of course, in so what are some important physical mechanisms or where can combustion community come into play and help with this problem? So when you look at, uh, for example, a wildland fire, when a wildland fire actually encroaches into an urban area, uh, the fire spread processes are actually similar to what you would actually see in an informal settlement in urban fire or a wildland fire. So even though you might think that initially these fires are totally different in nature, in terms of the actual physical mechanisms, there's a lot of similarities that are there to try to understand these different aspects of these fires. And when you look at the ignition mechanisms of the structures, for example, you have a lot of similarities as well. So for example, uh, 
Structures could ignite from directly being contacted by flame. There's also the hazards from the thermal radiation from the different sources. And as I mentioned, the firebrands are a big issue. Um, and we could also have the coupled effects of, for example, thermal radiation from a burning structure, let's say, as well as firebrands coming from burning structures or other vegetation, causing ignition of different kinds of, uh, of situations. So uh, here, basically, I'm listing some needs. Uh, these are, of course, the opinion of uh, myself and my colleague, Dr. Suzuki. Uh, these are no means the opinions of everybody, of course. Uh, so this is what we feel, basically, are some really important things that need to be studied. And we also think that you know the combustion science community can play a major role in these topics. Um, so uh, some of them are, for example, I mentioned the firebrand combustion, which I'll be talking in detail. There's also the nature of firewalls, which I'll talk a little bit about. And then you can see that there's some other topics, for example, the uh, gaseous and particulate emissions, as well as the uh, uh, initial ignition and the, and the fire spread through the fuels. And a very important topic as well is the transition from smoldering combustion to flaming combustion. Um, I'm not gonna talk about these today in the, in, in the bottom since I just don't have time. Right? We don't have such a long space for the webinar here. I'm just gonna try to touch upon the first two uh, this morning. Uh, and uh, uh, in the future, perhaps discuss it in another talk or another venue. Um, of course, those of you that are familiar with fire or these kind of topics, one thing you might be asking is, well, you know, there's a wide range of scales. So what can we actually do? And uh, um, you know, we believe the combustion community can play a critical role in these. Uh, if you look to the right here on these, uh, uh, for example, individual fuel element scale or different kinds of smaller uh, uh, type of uh, phenomena to really understand more detailed aspects of the combustion processes that are occurring in these cases. So uh, one pitch that we make to the combustion community, of course, is that um, uh, I myself um, am actually not someone who came from fire. I mean, my PhD was in mechanical engineering and I did uh, microgravity droplet combustion and measured soot formation using laser diagnostics and microgravity. So I became interested in fire because um, I thought that combustion science has a role to play and we can work on this particular topic. And so one thing that um, I found in uh, fire research in general is that um, uh, it's rare for combustion diagnostics to actually be applied to many fire problems. And so um, one problem, of course, we have is since we don't apply many diagnostics to many specific fire problems, a lot of the physics of these processes have actually not been fully revealed. And so, of course, in the end, end of the day, we want to develop you know, enhanced in very well-developed computational methods. But it would be very helpful in order to do that and, and to get some basic understanding of the physics of these different kinds of uh, processes that are occurring. So I'll talk very briefly about firewall combustion and, and sort of what it is and just give some brief thoughts on this. Um, so here's a picture um, of a firewall that actually occurred in uh, uh, Australia. And um, you know, this is something that's been recorded for a long time in urban and is also seen in wildland fires. And uh, um, it's, I think, an important area of research. Um, uh, and it's a very complicated area of research. And, uh, um, and something that I think that, uh, you know, clearly combustion community would have interest and also uh, could uh, help us also advance this topic a great deal. Um, there's been many great experimental studies on this topic. And those of you that were attending the um, recent uh, symposium uh, in a virtual setting, of course. If you had a chance to watch uh, Professor Liu's talk, which was an invited plenary, um, he gave a lot of, I think, excellent review of uh, what's going on with firewalls. So I, I have no intention of reviewing that I won't need too much detail here. Uh, other than I just want to touch on some areas that I, I think that are important and also um, offer some uh, food for thought for the community today to help you work on. Um, primary work on this was done by Professor Howard Emmons. So, we can never mention fire science uh, without talking about Professor Emmons. Uh, he was really a pioneer on this field. And uh, he did some great work in the 1960s. And, and since that time, um, once again, this is not inclusive. So you know, don't feel that if your research isn't mentioned, it's not important. It just, I don't have time to go into detail all of it. But um, this is just an example of some important studies that have been done looking at firewall uh, processes um, uh, throughout the years. And uh, since this time, uh, there's been a lot of, I think, great experimental facilities that have been developed. Um, the picture here um, is uh, um, actually some research that was done at USTC in China. 
uh, under uh, Professor Liu uh, uh, area. And clearly because of the coupling of the fluid mechanics and combustion, this is an important area where I think fundamental understanding is needed. Um, but there's still a lot I think left to be learned from this. Um, uh, one thing that I like to mention is that even though we are studying firewalls for a long time, there hasn't been so many efforts to actually understand the very complex flow field that's inherent in the firewall itself. Um, and just as a comment, as a pitch here for everybody, um, I think there's been some very great work on this topic by uh, Professor uh, Smith at Princeton University. And this is recent work by uh, Katie Hartle. Um, and uh, basically here they're using you know, PIV to basically look at the flow field within firewalls. And I think it's a really great research and also shows you that, you know, an example of applying more advanced diagnostic methodologies to get basic understanding of some of the uh, uh, physics of the problem. So um, I encourage anybody who is uh, watching this webinar or, uh, you know, students or people like that, um, you know, to consider that uh, the diagnostics or other kinds of techniques you might be able to apply to understand these type of systems in the future. Um, so with that, as I mentioned, it was very brief, but I wanted to move into firebrand processes as well and talk about this. Um, so here's a, a very simple schematic that we developed for a recent paper that we published in PEX on this topic. And uh, if you look at the firebrand problem, you have basically a bunch of different steps that are occurring here. You have the generation processes. So for example, when something is burning, you know, it's, if it's a structure, it's a vegetation, it's producing fire. And then these will eventually be lofted by the plume and then they can be transported and then they'll result in different kinds of ignition uh, scenarios. So, it's important to understand that each one of these aspects um, still is in need of understanding. And I think it's another great area that the combustion community could play an important role to understand these kind of processes. Um, I thank my colleague at NIST, Dr. Kathy Butler for this picture. Um, this is actually from the campfire in 2018. So this is, I think, a beautiful image of uh, firebrand processes in action. So you see actually uh, what we call uh, in the fire community, storms of firebrand showers being generated in these fires. So this is an important uh, aspect of this and, and how do we understand these kind of processes. Um, sadly, there's been really little data collected from actual fire disasters. So um, what motivated a lot of the research I'm talking about today is that, you know, when we even discuss, for example, what is a fire render? Like, what does it look like? What's its size? Or other kind of physical characteristics. Um, surprisingly, there's been little studies on this. So for example, for example, looking at post-fire investigations, we're trying to understand something. So some work we did, which is not rocket science in any stretch of the imagination, but it's basically, you know, we collaborated with CAL FIRE at the time and just did some burn pattern analysis of materials that were exposed to the Angora fire. And the Angora fire uh, was occurring near Lake Tahoe, if you're familiar with uh, geography in the United States. And just trying to get some understanding of, for example, what the fire brands were doing during these kind of processes. So um, it's an interesting paper to look at and just sort of understand that we need a lot of understanding from this process, even though it's something you see almost every day in the news and people talk about it, but there's a lot of just unknowns about the whole firebrand problem in general. So one thing that's of course important is the generation processes from the vegetation combustion. Um, so what we have here basically, oh, sorry, is a, um, this was a movie, but I'm not sure why it's not playing. This is a, 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 some experiments we did at NIST several years ago, and this is under no wind field, but the idea was that we just wanted to basically do combustion experiments of actual trees and then collect firebrands and see what kind of information we can get from them. So once again, nothing uh, uh, particularly rocket science, but just a simple quantification experiment of what firebrands are basically being produced. And if you look at the firebrand problem, and I think this is something that's very familiar to the combustion community in terms of fractal uh, geometry. Um, there was work that was basically done to try to essentially look at, you know, modeling vegetation as fractal geometries. And when you look at the uh, generation of firebrands from vegetation, for example, clearly the pyrolysis of the fuel elements is important. And during this combustion process, um, you know, Eventually, there'll be these stresses and moments that al allow firebrands to essentially be produced at some point when the, these uh, uh, branches, for example, lose their structural integrity. And so um, there's really fantastic work by D.K. Ezekoye on this at the University of Texas. And uh, he reviewed some of this in the encyclopedia for us. And you can see um, 
in some of the work that he did, he was using some of our early tree burn experiments here you see here uh, to try to look at, well, how can you understand this breakage phenomena during, the, during these firebrand processes? Um, and surprisingly to people, you know, probably on the webinar that these tree combustion experiments for firebrands were one of the first that were ever done. So even though there's so many discussions of firebrands for many, many years, you know, there's little measurement in terms of what firebrand size actually is from burning vegetation. But of course, the caveat with that is that those experiments that we did early on were done under no wind. It's wind, NIST itself has no wind facilities. So uh, what we did back many years ago is we wanted to look at what we call the firebrand yield. So for example, what are the yields of firebrands when you burn a certain amount of tree mass? And we published this paper in Fire Materials several years ago. But one thing that was missing, of course, is that, well, naturally you would think wind would be an important aspect of this problem. So as the firebrands are being generated, wind should Im impose some important additional you know, forces on the, uh, uh, the fuel and look at the generation. So recent experiments we've been doing here in Japan, um, these are experiments I'm showing you at the NRIFD facility. Um, that image shows basically the tree burning under no wind. So you can see you know, the traditional uh, a buoyant fire plume that you would expect. But once you do an experiment, let's say under three meters per second wind, you can see a totally different phenomenon that's occurring here. So for example, um, uh, you know, you can then also start to begin to understand these firebrand processes under these types of situations and, and see what's happening. And we'll be talking about this at the joint uh, US meeting. Um, uh, as I mentioned, um, I'm currently the Combustion Institute member of Japan, but since this year, um, the US meeting is completely virtual. So we've submitted some papers since we can join in a virtual setting, as opposed to traveling uh, there for that particular meeting. So if you're gonna be at that meeting, I hope you would join our presentation and listen to some of these details. Um, another thing probably you might be interested in is that related to firebrand showers. So um, I'll be talking later, we've developed an experimental technique which we call the dragon and it lets us produce controlled firebrand showers. And these are some experiments that we've done also here in Japan, looking at the combustion process of trees from firebrand showers. So uh, I think many people didn't think that it's possible that firebrand showers could actually ignite trees directly. But here you can see that the dragon is actually doing a, a, its best to result in these kind of ignition. And you can see some very interesting flame structures here, only under a three meter per second wind. So um, uh, this is sort of hot off the press data, but um, uh, some interesting encouraging results. And I think giving a flavor of just trying to explain what are the kind of things that are missing in this area in terms of what we actually need to understand in terms of these processes. So of course, you also would expect that in these outdoor fires, in addition to vegetation, you have these structures themselves that are burning. And so this is a problem, of course, very important to urban fires. So if you look at, for example, in Japan, as I mentioned, uh, in 2016, um, Itadawa City Fire, um, this was a rather severe urban fire. What was fortunate is that you can see behind there, that's, that's the ocean. So luckily, the, the fire couldn't spread anymore because the ocean was there. Um, but this was a very bad fire that was very difficult to put out. And even in the United States, even though the Wuri fire problem is also you know, much more of an issue, um, burning structures have also been identified as a very large aspect of the outdoor fire problem. Um, in Japan, they've done some very interesting experiments on this. So um, this was, I think, very, I was very fortunate. I was invited to observe this experiment, but here is an example. So if you actually have a very decent budget, you can burn an entire structure. So this was a full scale three-story house that was actually burned in Tsukuba, Japan. And my understanding is this one experiment was like 3 billion Japanese yen, um, which is a lot of money. And uh, so that's real scale, of course, but we want to be able to try to do something in a much more smaller scale that, you know, um, I mean, I don't have 3 billion yen every time I do an experiment, I can't afford that. So I wanna to try to understand how can we do it in a more um, uh, smaller type of uh, scale. So, what we've been working on for, for several years now is how can we look at such a complex problem and break it down to something much more simpler that we can actually understand and then do experiments and then trace that back to something that is still, you know, has the realistic aspects of it. So the idea here is it's very simple minded, I think. I mean, it's, can we design, for example, uh, structures to actually produce less fire bands during the fire? So the idea behind that is that if you, you wanted to come up with that kind of technology, 
how can you basically compare and evaluate materials to basically no longer produce firebrands? And so the idea, of course, is that you would like to develop some experimental methodologies to do this. So the idea is you start from something very complex and try to going down to smaller scales and see how can we understand that. So one of the protocols we developed um, is that basically we started to look at the combustion of much smaller uh, scale samples of, uh, let's say, structural elements that you would find in typical buildings. And here you see an image, for example, where we're doing a comparison of, you know, an actual scale element to something that's much more smaller scale and trying to understand these firebrand processes from these type of experiments. And what I'm showing here basically is we do these experiments. Here it is under different wind speeds. And then you could collect firebrands and then look at their, you know, more, their, their, let's say, physical characteristics, their size and other kinds of parameters. And, you know, this experiment here, you see the scale is much smaller than an actual structure. And the idea is, that can you get basic understanding from these type of situations uh, under these uh, uh, type of experiments? Um, and then what we can do is then we can compare these really simple experiments to experiments we can do over different scales and then also comparing to actual uh, fire results as well. So what I'm showing you here is um, uh, these are some many fine experiments that uh, uh, we have done here in Japan, and these were led by Dr. Suzuki. And you can see that's an actual full-scale mock-up of a structure that's burning in a wind field. And, and then you're going down to more individual components. And then you can collect information from these different fires, different fire sizes, and then try to get understanding of the fire burn processes that are occurring uh, from these type of situations. Um, and you can continue to do these kind of experiments as well. And you can see that when you look at much smaller scale uh, elements, you can get important information in terms of, you know, fire burn information and distributions and things like that to try to understand more aspects of this stuff. Another experiment we did, um, I think everybody's familiar with, um, uh, you know, clearly PV panel assemblies and new energy technologies. But rarely um, when these technologies are developed or designed, does anybody consider the, the secondary effects, which is, for example, fires. Um, so in the United States, there was a lot of research done by UL um, on uh, PV uh, panel assemblies. Um, but what we were interested in, for example, is that, you know, what if the PV panel itself is burning? Does it have the potential to generate additional firebrand showers itself? And so um, we wanted to develop some laboratory scale experiments to try to evaluate and look at the generation of firebrands from these type of elements. And this is also a recent paper we published in Fuel. Um, and uh, the idea here is that we use mock-ups. So we use a very simple uh, uh, size specimen and then we ignite this, and then we can adjust the angle of the specimen to try to simulate what you have in a PV assembly. And then we can look at the firebrand production and collect these type of information. So here's a typical experiment. Uh, this is burning under about an eight meter per second wind. And it's a simple mock-up. Um, as you probably know, PV assemblies are made of different kinds of materials. So we, we didn't have a budget to look at every single material. We just basically looked at a very simplistic uh, uh, type of surrogate, which is as a first cut, we're using oriented strand board. Um, there could be better choices, of course, but this is something that's very simple. And just looking at, you know, how does it uh, combust? How are the firebrands being produced? And also being done in a very, you know, smaller scale, we can get a lot of basic understanding of the processes themselves. And from these kind of experiments, you could do a lot of measurements, of course. Um, you could determine projected areas of the firebrands. And you can look at this as a function of angle, as a function of wind speed, and try to understand what type of firebrands are being produced under these kind of different assemblies, under these uh, um, uh, different uh, kind of situations. And another important thing also to look at is, um, so for example, as the assemblies are burning, since they're mock-ups, you can also do experiments to determine the mass loss profiles. And so the idea here is that, can we basically couple the evolution of the mass loss to the measured firebrand size and mass distributions. And the idea here is that also, is it possible to develop essentially test methods to let us rank and rate building materials for firebrand production? And the idea here is that, well, if you could develop such methods, then it's, you know, you can get the material science community to begin to basically design new materials that essentially just don't make firebrands. So therefore, if you don't make firebrands, it'll be a very important aspect to reduce this fire spread that's occurring in outdoor fires. So, uh, perhaps an interesting dream of mine, but I mean, I think it's something that's worth exploring in terms of, uh, you know, looking at the problem from a slightly different uh, aspect. And we'll be presenting this research um, 
once again, in another virtual conference. This is at the Japan Association for Fire Science and Engineering Symposium, which is virtual also this year, uh, this coming uh, May. Um, of course, you might be curious about the firebrand transport processes. Um, this is something you probably would imagine is been studied a lot. And one of the main reasons is that you can assume firebrand sizes and then do from basically Newton's second law of motion calculations, you know, how they might be transported. Um, and uh, uh, we review a lot of these studies in the PEX paper. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, Carlos Fernandez Perez group in Berkeley has done a lot of excellent work in this area. And this is something that um, uh, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about because there's been, a, I think, a lot of excellent studies on this. Um, and, you know, from these type of calculations, you can get some idea, for example, by assuming different fire sizes, for example, how far a firebrand of a different size might land. The only thing, of course, that's really unknown is that, you know, the initial conditions are usually assumed because there hasn't been a lot of measurements, as I talked about, in terms of the actual firebrand sizes and masses that are really being made in the Still an important area that I think needs uh, investigation, um, but with more data that's becoming available, it's possible to do also, I think, more enhanced calculations in the future. And I think a, a really undeserved area that's really in need of research is really the deposition and ignition processes. So now I'll switch and talk about, well, why did we need a dragon? And um, for those of you that uh, can read uh, uh, Chinese characters, uh, this is dragon. Um, We'll be discussing, you know, why did we need a dragon? What is, is a dragon going to offer for us? So as I mentioned, uh, several years ago when we determined the firebrand size distributions, we wanted to understand if you burn different kind of tree species, what kind of firebrands are being produced? So we did these experiments and we collected information on the firebrand and we could see this kind of information. And then we used these kind of experiments to say, well, can we do some basic experiments looking at the fundamental ignition these type of parameters. And so we simulated firebrands by different sizes of woods that we collected from the experiment. And uh, um, we then uh, uh, devised uh, an experiment to do this. And um, you know, to simulate vegetative firebrands, we assume these are more or less cylindrical in shape based on our experiments here that you see. And then at the time, so we, we didn't have much information from structured firebrands. We were assuming disks. And this was some suggestion that was actually uh, Pat Pagney's PhD student in Berkeley, uh, 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 Dr. Wuchi, had suggested from experiments also many, many years ago. And we did these experiments using, this was a very small scale wind facility that we have at NIST. Um, so nothing in terms of the scale that I'm showing in the facilities in Japan, but this is very small scale. So, you know, we basically did experiments where we can deposit like individual firebrands on samples. Um, but due to the small nature of the experiments and uh, limited capability, um, you know, we couldn't look at these shower effects that I mentioned. And when we started to study this, what we saw is that, you know, we could understand some things about the ignition, but um, there were a lot of things that we really couldn't really understand that were missing. And one of the things that we knew from actual events is that that shower phenomena. So, for example, how does a shower of firebrands differ from, like, if you're depositing individual firebrand and causing the ignition? So I'm not going to review the previous studies here, but the early studies, we found some interesting things that were for sure useful, but it led us to believe that there was some missing physics that we wanted to look at. So this is where we came to the, uh, the dragon. And the idea is that uh, here's a video. I don't know if you can see it or not, because um, the previous video wasn't working. But this is the dragon working in the one of the large-scale wind tunnel facilities here in Japan. And so the idea is that you want to simulate these firebrand showers that you see in actual uh, fire events. And then you can do a lot of interesting experiments from this uh, uh, type of device. So this is, I think, an example of like, you know, the merging of combustion science to try to understand these kind of processes by developing a new experimental apparatus. So we could then compare the firebrands that we produce from actual fire situations. As I mentioned, um, you'd be shocked to know there's very few information from actual fires. And so we wanted to compare what we can produce with this dragon technology to different types of uh, uh, situations. And here you see some comparisons of what we measured from the Angora fire. And uh, it's interesting to see that, you know, in actual fire events, when we quantified it, there were actually a lot of firebrands that are very small size. So um, uh, it's a very interesting, I think, uh, phenomena. And clearly there needs to be a lot more data on this. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the research needs. 
So at the Building Research Institute here in Japan, um, they built many years ago a large scale wind facility that's specifically designed for fire research. So, um, uh, and then what we did here is basically the dragon decided to take up residence in that facility. So when the dragon does experiments, um, you can, we can do many different uh, interesting experiments with this and try to understand some vulnerabilities and other kind of processes that are occurring uh, uh, with firebrands. Um, and the way that the dragon works basically is that, um, uh, uh, this is taken from a paper we, we presented at the Procedures and Combustion Institute 2017. Uh, but the idea is we have a continuously feeding capability where we can continuously ingest uh, different kinds of particles. And then depending on the size of the initial particles after the combustion, we can determine and produce different firebrand showers of different size and different mass and number of particles. And the idea is then you can direct these firebrand showers at different kinds of elements and understand the processes. Um, and then of course, we like to say we have a tail of two dragons. So the idea is that uh, we are always interested in trying to understand something in a smaller scale. And so the idea is that we have a, a large scale device, which we call the full scale dragon. And then we have a bench scale uh, dragon which resides in NRIFD, which we uh, nicknamed the baby dragon. So the idea is that this is a smaller uh, version of the device and it lets us uh, do some interesting uh, type of experiment. So here you see, um, this is a uh, experiment that we've been doing looking at basically fundamental deposition processes of firebrands in front of obstacles. So uh, one thing that's needed in, in order to understand firebrand processes is how do the firebrands deposit, let's say, in, a, in, a, in front of an obstacle in, in these kind of situations? And so um, here you see experimental capability that we can uh, develop. Um, also we're, we're presenting another paper at the joint US combustion meeting. Uh, Dr. Zuby will be presenting this paper. And um, so they'll be talking about these kind of experiments. And here's a comparison, for example. So from a larger scale experiment to a much smaller scale experiment, you know, we can generate these type of images. We can generate these type of experiments. So we can look at the accumulation processes and we can also look at uh, um, various other ignition kind of processes using these technologies. So it's a very interesting, I think, technique and very uh, useful to understand some of these processes. Um, we can then produce as well many different firebrand sizes. So for example, depending on what kind of material you ingest into the device, um, you know, currently we've been using these kind of materials. Um, we've been focused on generating firebrands characteristic of vegetation as well as characteristic of structure. So you probably can imagine a burning structure will produce different firebrands and will vegetation. And so from our experiments, we even try to understand what are these differences and then how can the dragon recreate these kind of scenarios to understand these different kinds of aspects. Um, and the technology has been you know, developed and cloned in many different institutes. So in the US, you might be familiar, there's a very like gigantic scale wind tunnel facility in IVHS where they actually have like 12 dragons there. It's a very, very large scale facility. In Portugal, um, they've also uh, cloned the baby dragon as well. But one thing that we need, of course, is we need globally accepted test methods. So uh, I'll, I'll be talking later about what's going on in ISO, but um, uh, you know, this type of technology is, is, is going in the direction of becoming an ISO uh, a standard test method. Of course, um, we can do a lot of uh, uh, simulations. Of course, I think many people are familiar with FDS, which is NIST has developed and NIST has put a great effort in this for uh, uh, many decades. And here is just some, you know, uh, flow experiments we're doing with FDS to basically look at how, you know, flow characteristics change for uh, firebrand penetration through vents. So one thing you might be interested in is that from a lot of investigation studies, people have found that uh, firebrands can simply enter the building envelope through the very tiny vents or things like that, and then cause ignition inside the structure. So you don't need to actually have a large scale ignition outside. You can just get a, a small burning particle, penetrate the building envelope, and then that could lead to ignition. And so uh, one thing that we did with the Dragon technology was then evaluate this type of experiment and then uh, work to develop an ASTM a test method and compare to you know, a large scale experiment. For example, how does that physics compare to a much more simplistic, smaller scale experiment to let you evaluate and compare building event performance? such that you can actually have in your home a firebrand resistant vent, such that you know, if you install that vent, firebrands are not gonna be able to penetrate and cause ignition of your home. Um, another practical application, of course, is that you might be surprised, this is very common in California and also Japan has a similar roof structure as well. 
is that you know, you would think that a roof um, such as a ceramic roof, clearly ceramic doesn't burn, but for example, if you have showers of firebrands, the showers can penetrate under these tiles and cause ignition under the roof itself. And this is a very dangerous scenario, for example, for fire services, because it's not an ignition event you could clearly see. And by the time it's really getting to be a problem, it's potentially you could lose a structure. So the idea is that what are the physics of these processes and how can you look at these uh, firebrands accumulating and penetrating under these vents in these situations? Um, and as well, you could use it for different comparison to different materials that you might have outside of a home or a structure, and then compare these uh, kind of results. For example, these are some common features from different building elements that you might have in, in real situations. And recent experiments we've done basically, of course, is the whole aspect of the structure to structure separation distance. So for example, as the structures become closer in, in an urban setting, how does that influence these firebrand accumulation processes? So this is an experiment we can do where we basically, we have the dragon and the dragon is basically just, you know, sending out a stream of firebrands and then looking at this in a large scale wind facility. So here you see, for example, the effects of the accumulation on, and this is for example, as a function of time, but we can change the wind speed. So you can see that as time goes by in the experiment, you can observe very interesting accumulation patterns in the firebrands. And so, what we're showing here, of course, is that the floor of the wind tunnel is lined with a non-combustible material. But you can imagine if it was an actual community or structure, if something was combustible there, you could have these potentially, you know, large accumulation of fire branch showers, which would cause the issues and a lot of danger in these situations. So you can see, for example, as you change the wind speed, you can observe very interesting, you know, physical patterns of these fire brands, for example. And how do these fire brands accumulate? How are these patterns being generated? And um, those of you that do computer modeling, of course, and CFD modeling, you would think this is something that, you know, clearly would be useful for validation exercise in terms of how can you understand these processes. And you can see that, for example, you know, as you change these distances of the separation, you can get vastly different accumulation zones, um, both, you know, upstream and downstream of, of these kind of situations. So, um, you know, very basic, I think, experiments, but just giving you some understanding of what's happening from these type of uh, uh, flow situations of these burning particles uh, under a wind field. And also, um, you know, a different aspect of course is that uh, in many countries, of course, throughout the world, there's an important aspect to preserve cultural heritage. So uh, one thing in, in Japan, it's important of course, is there are a lot of cultural heritage sites. Um, and so one, of, one problem of course is these have uh, you know, very combustible roofs. So for example, if you've ever seen a thatched roof, it's a very combustible material. So what we wanted to do basically was we wanted to use the dragon to look at just a mock-up of this. So here's a mock-up of a thatched roof assembly that we did experiments with. And you can see the effect of the firebrand showers on the basics uh, processes of ignition. So you can see that, you know, obviously these thatched roof materials don't get along well with firebrand showers. So these kind of experiments can then be, you know, lead you to develop effective mitigation methods. So for example, how can you develop mitigation strategies in order to preserve these uh, cultural heritage sites? And this is important and, you know, we're focusing on Japan, but there's uh, many countries that have these kind of situations. Um, a lot of the Nordic countries, for example, have similar constructions. So uh, how can this information be used to uh, preserve those kind of uh, uh, situations? And going to some theory, um, surprisingly, even for firebrands, there's very few theoretical studies of ignition. So uh, this is a, uh, the hot spot ignition theory. And I don't have time to go into so many details, but we review this theory in our, our, our PEC. And the idea is that, you know, if you have a non-reactive hot particle, you, uh, you know, researchers have come up with formulations to understand the ignition process. But unfortunately, you know, a firebrand is not a non-reactive uh, particle. It's, it's a burning piece of wood. And so uh, we've been doing experiments to try to understand the basics of, you know, what if you have the coupled effects of ignition? So in addition to firebrand showers, what if you have an external radiant heat applied? And so the idea here is that you have an external radiant heat uh, load applied to a, a, a simplized, you know, very simplistic fuel bed, and the dragon is uh, depositing firebrand showers on this. And then you can basically look at some basic information of ignition. So for example, as you vary the energy that you apply to the fuel bed, for example, you know, how do the number of firebrands influence ignition? 
How does the wind speed influence the ignition? And so, um, you know, those of you that are combustion scientists, you're, you're, would be probably surprised that there's just so many unknowns in this field. And there's so many unknown experiments that need to be done. So it's still, you know, in the infancy, I think, in terms of what needs to be done in terms of where we are with everything. And also we've been, because we can do these unique experiments of the showers of firebrands, um, we've also been trying to come up with essentially new theoretical approaches to the problem. So, you know, rather than simple brute force modeling of the problem, for example, I mean, is there any room for new theories that might help? So um, when the Commercial Institute advertised the new journal Applications in Energy and Combustion Science, uh, Dr. Suzuki, you know, called me and said, okay, let me should submit our, let's submit a paper there because we think this is a very interesting topic. So and an important application. So we published this paper. Um, and the idea was that, you know, we were looking at these showers of firebrands and then developing some theoretical approach to try to understand ignition. So a long way to go, uh, not completed by any sense of the imagination, but just give you some idea that there's a lot of things that are missing or unknown uh, related to this. So here's some thoughts about some needs. And I apologize for this busy slide, but um, there's, it's busy because there's a lot of needs, okay? So when we look at uh, some of the needs we listed from our PECS paper, as well as some of the needs listed from the forum paper, um, you know, there still needs to be a lot of experiments done on the transport and deposition processes. Um, also, we need to better understand the firebrand flux from different kinds of sources. And this is where also something that I think the combustion community is a key player because um, there's a lot of state-of-the-art imaging techniques that could be applied here. Um, and also when you look at the basics of the firebrand burning itself, you're looking at the char growth, the effect of the char layer on the firebrand burning rate, for example, and how does that influence the extinction, for example? Um, this is something that could be looked at in detail. Um, and, uh, you know, when I talked about the firebrand generation, I mentioned that there is some basic modeling approaches for vegetation on fractal geometries, but there's essentially no models at all for the firebrand generation from structures. I mean, it's a whole open area of research. So how can we develop some information and you know, understand those processes as well? And um, also the aspect of, you know, internationally accepted test methods. So this is where probably, you know, the fundamental combustion needs meets the much more uh, applied needs in terms of, so how can we develop test methods to actually evaluate material performance and also look at structure design in terms of these firebrand exposures. So this will bring us to the last topic. I hope I'm not so bad on time. Um, and this is related to what are we doing in ISO? So the International Standards Organization in terms of loud directed fires in the built environment. So um, in 2017, um, ISO, it's, a, it's a, a very large organization that developed international standards. Uh, they were having their meeting that year in Scuba, Japan. So um, I was running a bunch of experiments at the time in Scuba. So colleagues said to me, look, I mean, Sam, can you come give a presentation? Because we, we want to know your opinion about this. And so basically, you know, we presented, um, if you wanted to basically make it structures more ignition resistant to these firebrand exposures, are the current codes adequate? And clearly from our knowledge of it, previous you know, events, it was not adequate. So we made a presentation and uh, this then led to basically having an international workshop at the Delft ISO meeting in the Netherlands in 2018. And the idea here was basically, um, you know, we looked at an overview of all the global standards in terms of what's going on with this. And, you know, as a global community of many countries involved in ISO, I mean, ISO has more than 30 countries. It was clear that there's a lot of missing science and we need to work on this problem. So we formed a task group called uh, TG3, which was large order fires in the built environment. And this was advised to basically give it guidance to ISO in terms of, so what should we do for this problem? And we had a workshop and other kind of activities. And this resulted in um, the formation of a, a formal working group. Um, which is called the ISO TC92 WG14. And we have uh, many countries involved from Japan has several members, France has several members, Sweden, uh, Nigeria, um, Austria, uh, the UK, Sweden. I mean, I don't want to forget any of my members because they're all great and important to me, but there's just, just many, many countries are involved with this. Germany, of course. Um, and uh, uh, so as part of this task group, what we've been doing um, as a first step is that we formally added the Dragon design uh, to develop to an ISO standard. So the Dragon is currently on track uh, 
to be developed in terms of an ISO global standard for firebrand showers. So, and this was possible because of the work that uh, Dr. Suzuki and I had worked on um, based on a paper that we published in Fire Safety Journal. And so the idea is that uh, we are working to develop an ISO standard for this type of uh, uh, firebrand showers. And also uh, we are working on draft documents to understand all the different approaches and standardization throughout the world. Believe it or not, this is a lot of work as you can imagine. I mean, sampling these standards and codes from you know, more than 30 countries and trying to understand how they're going to approach these. And also uh, what you might be surprised, I think you saw in the beginning of the presentation, even though it's such an important global problem, there isn't basically globally accepted definitions in every country for different terms. So basically what we've done is also uh, reconvened an ISO working group to basically you know, add these important terminologies that can be globally accepted to these problems. So um, uh, once again, a, a lot of work that needs to be done in a, a future effort. So I think with that, I hope I'm at about one hour. Um, I wanna thank everybody for their time. And uh, I hope from the presentation, people could feel that fire science can be interesting. Um, since I think it's a, a very interesting topic and uh, uh, um, a very interesting topic that combustion science could play a very, very important role. And with that, uh, I'll take any questions or we can have a discussion. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Sam. Very interesting yeah, talk. Right. We actually have a few questions from the audience and I have a few minutes left in today's talk to um, go over them. So mm -hmm. let me just call them up here. The first is from Dr. Maruta. Due to its multi-scale nature in the field of fire research, it is presumed that a lateral thinking approach is necessary in addition to a precise vertical thinking when narrowing down the approach to a research target. Could you comment on this? Yes, I mean, I think that um, it's a very, I think, good, uh, uh, a good point. I mean, I, I think that uh, bringing this topic to, you know, in, to the need of the, of the global combustion community is really important because we need I think many different approaches and many different thinking on this, because I mean, as you see, uh, we tried to highlight some of the physics that are involved, but there's a lot of things that are just essentially still unknown um, because it just hasn't been uh, well researched. And one thing that I'm always told when we present different aspects is that, I remember when we presented last time in the combustion symposium, another question was related to, you know, people are, are not really ever sure, like since it's so complex, what aspects should we start to work on or these kind of things? So I think, Bringing as many minds and, and many thinking to the problem will really help us, I think, in the future to make some, you know, substantial impacts on the problem, I think. Okay, great. Uh, second question is from Jay Gore. Are there studies focused on radiative preheating of the materials? Yes, yeah, so there's, um, in, when you look at also from the global standards, initially when they developed a lot of test methods for like outdoor fire ignition, the initial thinking early on was that the radiation was the main aspect of ignition. But what was discovered, you know, over the last probably 15 to 20 years from a lot of post-fire investigations is that it, it turned out that the main cause of ignitions was actually the firebrand showers themselves. And so this is why now there's been a lot of focus on actually looking at, you know, new test methods that allow us to look at, for example, the showers of firebrands. And for example, as I mentioned, when I talked about the, um, uh, the, the firebrand vent issue is an example. So, you know, you could have a, let's say a very well hardened structure, but for example, if the vent is a weak point, a firebrand can simply go in and just cause ignition of the structure. So um, this is something that's being reviewed in ISO, as well as also these uh, different various uh, global uh, test methods. Great. Uh, next one is from Wen Ting with a question from a younger member of the audience. My nine-year-old son is listening to the entire talk during breakfast and loves it. He thinks that flame whirl is cool and should be called a flame tornado. He loves to burn stuff in the backyard and found that pine straws are much easier to burn than others. They burn really fast and strong. How do you differentiate pine straws from other plants in research? So that's a great question. I mean, we, uh, Something else. So we also did a lot of experiments with uh, what's common, for example, I know Wei Tang is in Georgia, I believe, and I know pine straw mulch is very common. So in Georgia, you know, we did a lot of experiments with that. So the fuel characterization is very important. So when you're looking at different kinds of fuels, you know, we have to do a lot of detailed experiments to understand, for example, the fuel moisture content, uh, different, you know, porosity of the fuel bed and packing ratios and these kind of things. So, 
there's a lot of important physical parameters that have to be adjusted to understand uh, these type of uh, uh, situations. So uh, hopefully uh, you will consider becoming a fire scientist in the future since there's a lot of things that you can do. Thank you very much. I will pass your information to him. <laughs> <laughs> so a question of my own. Um, so most of the fire brands that you've looked at from my understanding are focused on wood and um, natural materials, but what would you say are the key differences between a fire brand from a natural material and a synthetic one, for example, from the photovoltaics, which may have a, a synthetic coating or, or, or the like. Do you look at this? Is there a big difference? Well, this is something that also we are, I mean, that's why we started that kind of research. I mean, it's something that would be important to look at in the future. I mean, the main focus, as I said, it's true, it's been mainly on, you know, like woody materials. But the idea was then to start looking at, you know, the idea came in from the PV panel, for example, that um, the research that had been done in the past wasn't looking at the production of firebrands. It was just thinking, of, like, what if your house has a PV panel on the roof and your house gets ignited and there's a fire? you know, are there dangers to the firefighters in terms of like coming to extinguish that fire? And so we were thinking that, you know, exactly in line with your question, I mean, what are the differences in terms of the physical characteristics of the firebrands that would be produced from these kind of materials? So this is something that we're hoping to look at and get more information on the future. And I think when we discuss the research needs, it's a uh, important thing that's currently missing, I think, that needs to be looked at from, you know, various kinds of uh, materials and these, these basic kind of properties. Okay, I don't see any more questions from the audience. I do have one more, if, if I may. Maybe I missed it in your talk, or maybe maybe you've looked at it elsewhere. But the distance over which these fire brands can travel, particularly in high wind situations, I imagine, um, have different impacts on ignitability and ignition probability, depending on how far they travel. So what would you say um, would be the way to actually um, quantify the quantify the danger for versus distance for various um, wind levels and wind loadings. Okay, so basically, I mean, for that, uh, from those, as I mentioned, from the transport calculations, you know, you can get some idea maybe potentially how far they would fly. So then what we are trying to do related to that is, you know, looking at the different characteristics, for example, in a wind tunnel, you can basically do experiments and people have done, you know, looking at, for example, the burning properties. And then, for example, if you simulate, let's say, you know, this firebrand is going to be transported, let's say, three kilometers in a, right. in a, in a room, for example. I mean, you know, what is the energy content of that firebrand? Could it then potentially ignite fuels? So those are also experiments that uh, there's been some work done on in that area, looking at just individual burning properties of the fuels. But this is where the dragon also comes in, because then we can, you know, also directly simulate um, some of those, you know, much more direct physical contact properties of the firebrands actually impinging and in depositing on the fuel beds. And then look at those uh, those kind of parameters. So, um, still an, an important area to look at. And uh, um, you know, I think all the questions that we're getting are great because I the, the purpose of the talk is to give everybody the idea that even though it's an important area, there's a lot of things that need to be done, and there's a lot of unknown. So, um, you know, I know many times when we talk about fire in the combustion community, everybody sometimes is a little bit afraid of fire since it's complicated. And it's, it's you know a very difficult thing to look at, but um, you know, when you start to think about the things and break it down into some of these basic processes, there's just a lot of, I think, basic experiments that could be done to answer a lot of these unknowns and important questions and how that could feed into the approaches in the computation. Because, I mean, the computations still require validation in, in these kind of processes. So how do we understand these things, I think, is a very important aspect. Okay, great. Well, I see no more questions from the audience. So if we all want to turn on our cameras and thank the speaker, we'll, we'll close off today's session. <laughs>